How's everyone doing? Yeah. Woo! Okay, really excited to be here. Um, at the heart of this talk is just a, a discussion and um, some of my journeys reconnecting with my roots as an African and some lucky accidents that kind of happened along the way. And so, um, okay, so about me, I'm a research engineer focused in machine learning at Cloudera Fast Forward Labs. We have an office over at Brooklyn. And um, my interest is at the intersection of human-computer interaction and applied artificial intelligence. And in my free time, I try to contribute to the, the machine learning community, and I serve as a Google developer expert for, for, for this year, uh, focused on machine learning. And so a little bit, you know, let's go back to the background, you know. So I, I'm from, uh, I, I grew up in West Africa, and particularly from the eastern part of Nigeria. And one of the import of, important traditions that my family had growing up was that, um, once a year, every member of our tribe will all go to a village. And so essentially, it's mostly people in the cities, people that live really far off will all can, kind of come together uh, in this, at December, at the end of the year, every year. And then we'll have this, this really nice uh, convening. And so my first lucky experience was that once a year, I got this beautiful opportunity to speak my local language and to play in the red earthy sand that's common to the eastern part of Nigeria. And so a highlight of this gathering was that um, something called the masquerade dances. And it's an event where, you know, dancers will put on this fierce, elaborate mask and perform really incredible acrobatic dances. And this was my first encounter, encounter with, with African mask. And all I knew back then was that, you know, my parents would tell me that, you know, the person who wore the mask wasn't, they weren't themselves anymore. They, were, they now represented the ancestors and represented the spirits. And so um, I'll just give a really fast overview of uh, what I think African masks mean. And so the first thing is that you will notice that most of the time they're fierce, and that's because they depict deities, spirits of the ancestors, they depict mythological beings, and others believe that you know, they, have, uh, they, they represent beings that have power over humanity. And the second important thing is that they represent uh, a central part of community memory in the sense that they represent our ancestors and they're used typically during celebrations, initiations, crop harvesting, war preparations, and peacetime and war times. And the other thing is that they're quite sophisticated. And so you will find out that, you know, they're, they have really complex designs in them and the materials uh, that you use to design this mask really vary from wood to, um, to bronze, to brass, and to clay. And more importantly, they are actually really functional. So as opposed to just artistic pieces that are created to be consumed for their visual excellence, they're actually functional, much like how we will put in clothing today to reflect our identity. And so on the slides there, we have three masks. So the first is one from uh, the Igbo tribe, which is my tribe, the one on the left. And we have a bronze mask from another tribe from Nigeria. And we have like a mask from, from a part of West Africa and Congo. And so fast forward 15 years later, um, I live in Manhattan, and I found myself looking for ways to rec reconnect with, my, with, my, uh, with my, 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 my roots and my history. And so for those of you who actually can, I don't know, you can draw, you can do all kinds of nice arts, you could color within the lines when you were a kid, more power to you, but I just couldn't do that. But what I actually could do was that I can code. And so for me, all of, this, um, all of this process was how I could take technology, uh, essentially what I do with my day job, machine learning, and then apply that uh, to explore my historical origins. And so this seemingly un 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 unlikely marriage between technology and art is not so much different from the combination of this African shirt I have here and this pair of Levi's jeans that I'm, I'm wearing right now. And so they're both like an expression of, of who I am, you know what I am today and what I used to be, um, what my ancestors were. And so to, get, to kind of go about this task, I distilled it into two questions. How can I use neural networks to explore African art? And this is important because to interpret uh, is to understand, and a great way to understand is to create. And so can we use neural networks to actually create new art? And what exactly does that mean? And when this is done, how can we ask results of the results that have been obtained? So for example, how novella, the mass that they generated, what patterns emerge, and 
other questions like how does data quality affect results? And so the, the image you see right here behind me, none of these images or masks are actually real. All of these are all new or uh, realizing novel masks that are dreamed up by uh, a neural network. Cool, right? And so to give a quick background, kind of this work falls within the broader area of uh, generative art. So essentially it's art that in whole and in part has been created using some autonomous systems. And there's been a rich history of tools that have been designed in this area to, to help with efforts like this. And so you'll see tools like P5JS processing. And if you've used a bit of that, the way it works is that you know you have this nice artistic vision in your head, you go, you write some code and you bring it to life. However, neural networks kind of take a different approach, take a different, uh, they're a different paradigm in the sense that they're a class of software that allows the machine to learn rules directly from data as opposed to, um, to explicit code, coding. So for example, in P5GS, if we wanted to generate a set of concentric circles, we would write some code to do it in a couple of lines. Um, but if we were gonna use neural networks, what we'll actually go ahead to do is to get like a couple of thousand examples of concentric circles and then we'll then train a model that learns to generate a single concentric circle. This doesn't make sense, right? Why do we want to do that? And so if we just want to do something simple like a concentric circle, this works, it's cool. But if we want to generate a more complex natural image, let's say like an image of people, this nice beautiful gathering like these people sitting and listening to a presenter, um, how, are you, how, how are exactly are you gonna write uh, I don't know, a program to actually do that? That's more complex. And so to, to do this, um, what I applied in this work was something called generative adversarial networks. I'm sure all of you here have heard this before. But just for completeness sakes, uh, I, I would describe GANs as a pretty cool arrangement where two neural networks play a competitive skill game with some interesting results. And so a common analogy here is that of a, the con artist and the police. And so the con man begins as an amateur and he produces some fake art that promptly sends him to jail because the police looks at it and says like, oh dude, you know, this is really bad, you're going to jail. <laughs> and then in jail, this guy meets the godfather who tells him, why he was caught, and then he tells him, you know, these are all the secrets to making it better, and makes him promise on his life that he'll take this information and he'll use it for good and not for evil. So this guy takes all that good information, he serves his time, he gets out of prison, he takes the Godfather's lesson to heart, but he uses it to make better fix, unfortunately. And he profits immensely from it for a while, until the police then comes up with new techniques to actually detects he's done bad stuff again and sends him to jail. He meets another godfather, he gets better, and the cycle just continues. And so with GANs, it's kind of like that. So it's a neural network that has two parts. There's one called the generator, and there's one called the discriminator. So the generator takes in random noise, it generates an image. The discriminator attempts to predict if the image generated by the generator is actually real or it's fake. And so during training of this network, and you have to trust me on this, what happens is that G, gets increasingly better at generating images that look like the real deal, while D kind of gets, tries to get better at discriminating that and gets to a point where it just can't tell what's real and what's fake. And at that point, you have a network that can actually generate uh, kind of images that look kind of real. And so to go about my pro project, I had like a, a three-step plan. And so the first was, you know, going ahead, collecting data, training the model, and then doing some kind of evaluation. And so the first step is the data curation step is the favorite part of the process, right? No. <laughs> and so it's this tedious, tedious process of you know, scraping some data, you know, manually hunting down some images. Then you curate this entire data set carefully. You remove vector images. You remove unrelated content. You remove duplicate content. And then you remove masks that just have nothing to do with Africa. Yeah, and so there's also some interesting computational approaches to actually do this, uh, performing this curation. I guess that's a, a discussion for another day. And at the end of this, I came up with about 10,000 curated images of masks. And so I'm like, okay, let's start with, um, with training. And so I kind of started out with some sample code, and you always should do this with neural networks. There's a lot, a ton of moving parts. You really wanna write things from scratch, especially the first time. And so I started out with some sample implementation in TensorFlow, uh, optimized for TPUs. I selected TPUs because for a project like this, you wanna run 
tens or hundreds of experiments and a TPU could be difference between running something overnight and getting done in 20, getting results in 20 minutes. If you're gonna run 100 or 200 experiments like I ended up doing, uh, you don't wanna wait overnight for each experiment to conclude. And so the main challenges there was around writing a, a data pipeline to suit my data and then modifying the sample codes to go beyond generating 32 pixel images to scale up to something like 64 pixel and 128 pixels. Okay, and, and at this point, you know, I had a model that could generate this really, really interesting looking um, um, mask. And at this point, I'm like, you know, can we go deeper? Can we really, really dig deeper? Can we start asking questions of these results that we have at the moment? And some of those questions were, you know, what representations does the, does the GAN learn? Um, what, are, are the results really novel? You know, if we, if we take one of the masks that are generated by this neural network model, and we compare it with all of the data within the data set, we, we find that, you know, it has just copied some of those data. And if it was doing combinations, how was it doing these combinations? And so to answer this, these questions, I built something called, um, um, something I'm, I'm calling the, some, some tool for al algorithmic art inspection. It's, it's a web interface. And what it does is that, you know, for each of the, for each of the images that have been generated by this model, uh, we could go into the main data set and we could perform a semantic search to see, okay, what are the images that are most similar to, to that image. And that way, you know, this form of exploration also allowed me to discover, you know, that the GAN had learned to utilize some, uh, types of textures and, and colors. For, for, so, for example, uh, some of the images it generated focused on using wood materials versus bronze. And I also learned to focus on various geometries. Um, so, for example, it learned to focus on oval masks. It learned to focus on oblong masks in some cases. And then it learned to focus on masks that had like hair or hair-like projections. And the way this comparison is done is that, you know, we take a, a pre-trained uh, neural network model, something that's trained on a large data set of images called ImageNet, and we get it to extract important features from, uh, from, from any image, and then we use that representation of extracted features to kind of compare uh, between the generated images and all of the, uh, and, and the actual image data set. And so it's a really interesting tool. Um, I, I do have it online. When you have some time, definitely check it out. And so, but wait, um, what we have is that we have a model that generates 64 pixels. I mean, who, who, who looks at 64 pixel images when we have 4K, 4K screens, right? Nobody's gonna do that. And so, at this point, the idea is, can we do better? And it turns out that, yes, we can. And you know, we can actually use something called super resolution GANs to further enhance and zoom uh, into the generated images. And so while I do not have too much time to go into the details of how super resolution GANs work, all you need to know is that it magically can learn to hallucinate potentially correct information needed to upsample or enhance an image. It is trained with pairs of low resolution and high res resolution images, and the task is to generate a high resolution image when presented with a low res resolution image. You know, this, this process is kind of really nuts. So imagine that your boss walks into your, your office one day, and it tells you to reconstruct the five-page memo from, a, from 10 years ago, given a half-page summary that exists. That's nuts, right? So it's like, you know, there's this five-page memo. The original document was 10 pages. Uh, by tomorrow morning, do you think you can get me the original stuff? That's really nuts, yeah. And this is kind of what a super resolution GAN tries to do. And so, what do the results look like? And so on the, on the image you see here, it's a 64px image generated by uh, the neural network. We pass that through a super resolution GAN. And on the right, we have a 378 pixel uh, output. And, and that's a 6x, um, it's a 6x uh, up sample. And not just that, if you look carefully, you will find out that there's information in this up sample piece that just wasn't there in the low resolution piece. There's, there's no other way, if you use bicubic interpolation, there's just no way you will get results that look like this, it's pretty cool. And so more examples, this is some of my favorite examples of what the, the GAN kind of came up with. And so it's two levels of interpretations now. So first, the first GAN, you know, it does that whole generation, and then this second GAN comes up and helps and needs additional information that makes it really, really cool, wow. And so this is another example, it's all very nice, another example of, of generated mass, all very cool. 
And this uh, final example, uh, this is more, uh, a little more abstract, but you kind of still get the feeling that, oh, you know, it's, it looks like wood material, there's like eyes there, there's representations of a nose and there's a mouth. And so reflections, what did I get out of this project? So the first thing is, um, I think one of the things I'd like to share is that, you know, it's kind of important that we start to build tools for something I'm calling um, algorith algorithmic art inspection. It's not just enough for us to build tools that, you know, generate arts. It's also important that we build tools that help us evaluate, you know, what's the quality of the stuff that's coming out from these generated networks. Um, how can we evaluate that in terms of novelty, visual quality? And I think this is an area that we, uh, for, for those in this space, it might be worthwhile spending some, some time in. And for the tool, uh, I kind of like take a first step in this area by building the, the web interface that you could use to kind of inspect, you know, what has this, uh, what has this model learned to generate. And so the next thing is, um, the other reflection I had, you know, representations and diversity of AI. So currently in the world that where we have generative art, and, uh, especially in the neural network paradigm, that's, you know, all you will see right now is classical arts, I don't know, I don't know paintings, portraits. Uh, it's kind of important to have more uh, diverse examples of, of art. And similarly, I think it, AI has the opportunity to actually bring more attention to, to the area of African art and African art history. And then finally, there's this discussion of tensions, you know, um, who has agency? Who has agency right now? Do we have, um, is it the man or the machine who actually is in charge, who, who actually, you know, um, essentially who actually has ownership over the material that's, that's created? And then finally, there's a lot of important reflections on ethics that, that kind of like um, uh, go ahead with this. And so finally, this is my final slide. Um, for those who are interested, uh, the code is, is actually here uh, on the links that I have here. And the final, uh, the final interesting thing is that uh, uh, last week I had a simple uh, a discussion with the guys at, at, at Google. And I, I mentioned to them that I'll be giving this talk and they were really excited about it and they're like, you know, for everyone who's attending Bang Bang Con this year, if you're interested and you want access to TPUs to do generative art research, um, you could use this code and go to this link and you will have access to five GPUs and 20 preemptible GPUs per person. Thank you.